Um, thank you, PM, uh, for setting that uh, context for us. Uh, maybe I'll ask the first few questions when, uh, and to allow time for the audience to think of the questions that they may want to ask PM. Um, just following up on, on your opening uh, remarks, I think it is clear that the um, China-US relationship will be one defining factor uh, on how the world would look like uh, going forward. And looking at the domestic factors now in both countries, the China and the US, and looking at what's happening on the global uh, stage as well, how do you see that relationship developing over the years? It's the most consequential relationship in the world. It's one which concerns us and every other country in the world a great deal. It's, the trends are worrying. Um, each country sees the other as an adversary at least a strategic challenger. From the American point of view, it's a new country growing, possibly exceeding, and aiming to supplant it. From the Chinese point of view, they are a country which is developing, progressing, and they see the US wanting to hold them back and restrain them. And Neither trust the other. Therefore, each has to take precautions against the other. But in the process of taking precautions, you create further doubts and suspicions and counter-reactions, and things can get worse. And the domestic mood in each country is also difficult. In America, it's complicated by election politics, which always heats the temperature up. But it goes beyond election politics. It's a broad national sense that this is a challenger unlike anything which they have met before, as Graham Allison said. And on China's side, there is a concern that the world, the Americans, are trying to suppress them, hold them down, although the Americans solemnly assure them that this is not so. And so there is potential for problems. Taiwan is one of them, but all the other issues between them are difficult to handle. The saving grace is that I think both sides do not want conflict, even though neither side is yet ready to make significant accommodation and compromise. So there, there is contact, they are talking. I think Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, is talking to the Chinese, Wang Yi, at a high level. And maybe, quite likely, the President Xi and President Biden will meet in APEC and have a further conversation as they did last year in Bali. But this is a relationship which needs to be managed by both sides because if it goes wrong, it's disastrous for both sides and also for the world. And thinking that closer to home, uh, I think we have seen the arrival of uh, China as a Pacific power when for many years it was just the US. How do you see this changing um, the relationship China will have with countries in Asia and in ASEAN? Uh, China has become a very big factor in uh, all our perspectives. It's our biggest trading partner for nearly every Asian country including all the U.S. allies, the Koreans, the Japanese, the Australians. Uh, it's an economic player. It's a strategic presence. It's a growing strength in the region and a great opportunity for the countries in the region to cooperate with, to trade with, to invest in, to do business. But at the same time, every country in, the world, in Asia wants to keep its links with the rest of the world with America, with Europe, and they want this to be a region which is open because you would like to have more than one best friend. As the Mexicans sometimes say, America is our best friend, whether we like it or not. And that's a reality. I mean, that's the way the world is. And in Asia, China is a very good friend. America has been a friend for a long time. And the question is, is it possible for countries in Asia to develop that relationship and keep both, 
even though some may be closer to China in their stand, some may be U.S. allies, some may be friends of the U.S. and have a lot of security and other cooperation with the U.S., but they want to keep that relationship with China because they accept that China is going to be a major partner, major player, it's not going to disappear, and we have to learn with it, and China really will benefit if it is able to co-prosper with the countries around it. So it depends on how China plays its cards and how deftly it is able to grow its influence without making other countries feel that they have been squeezed, pressured, or coerced. And it depends on the countries in Asia developing their relationships with China, but at the same time maintaining links with the rest of the region, or with the rest of the world. I think they want to do that. I say that because they do not take identical positions as the U.S. does. To the U.S., China is a strategic competitor, and they want to make sure they win. To Asian countries, we are not competing with China. They are 1,400 million people. We are just 6 million in Singapore. Even Indonesia is 250 million. India is bigger, but India is in a different uh, strategic position. And so, you know, we accept that this is the way the region is. Let's try to make the region work. And I think if that is the attitude, and if there's that sensitivity and consciousness on both sides, it can be made to work. The Americans have been a major force in Asia since at least the Second World War. It's now nearly coming on 80 years. And they remain welcome. I mean, there are times when you feel, wow, the Americans, yeah, the people talk about the ugly Americans. But given that it's 80 years, two and a half generations, three generations, actually the Americans have been dominant in this region while giving countries space to grow, to develop, to compete with one another, another peacefully and not to be held down or squatted upon. And that's why they're still welcome after so many years. And if the Chinese can achieve something like that, I think the region can prosper. Maybe I can ask one question on um, a topic that uh, we discussed quite a lot uh, the past two days, and that's uh, climate change. And one would think that climate change would be one issue that could unify the world, uh, bring countries together on how to respond to it. But in actual fact, I think we have seen a lot of competition, dispute, self-interest uh, instead. Um, how do you think countries can come together to work uh, on this issue? And what are the situations they should avoid, right, if we are to respond effectively? Uh, it's a very complex problem and it's a very serious problem. It's existential. I mean, we are, mankind is tampering with a global ecosystem and climate in ways with consequences we are completely unable to predict. And you can easily tip it out of balance and create within a few lifetimes a completely different climate and environment where living will be harder, growing food will be harder, existing will be in, under threat and therefore with huge people migrations, movements, political instability, and conflict. And so you have to address it. And I would say there are three buckets of issues which you have to deal with, and it's different kinds of difficulty. One, where you can cooperate. You need technology to solve climate change. You need to think of work out markets to deal with carbon trading. You need to work out infrastructure so that you can trade green energy. Yeah. You need electricity grids, you need uh, your, your tech 
infrastructure within your each economy to be to be changed. The, Amer the Europeans are talking about changing from heaters to heat pumps. I mean, it sounds simple, but they're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars of investments. It's not so easy to do, but these are areas where we naturally need to work together. I mean, you, if you want to trade carbon, we have to work out the rules. If you want to build, if you want to export or import electricity, we have to work together and build a grid. I think these are the areas which are cooperative. Then you have the question, how do we cut back our carbon emissions? And we all have to cut back our carbon emissions. I think the scientists are quite clear. We have to go to net zero. How soon can we do it? How can we do that? And here there's a bit of a game of chicken. If I don't do it, if, if you don't do it, why should I do it? And I'm not going to do it. You better move first because otherwise you may cause the system to tip over. And here, we all want the result to come down. We all know what we have to do to do our part. But it's also easier to do my part if you are doing your part, then I can justify to my people, well, everybody else is abiding by the rules. We have to, otherwise we'll be a pariah. And that's harder, but I think in principle that can be done. The third, which is the hardest part, is who owes whom what? Because there's a question of historic responsibility. Most of the carbon in the air was put there by the countries which are now OECD countries, the developed countries. Most of the developing countries didn't put the stuff into the air. So now you want us all to cut back, but you created three quarters of this problem, so you owe me. That's the way the argument goes. But the counter-argument is, if we now all don't cut back, we are all going to be sunk. So who owes whom doesn't count. And furthermore, the historical track record of countries paying another country vast sums of money doesn't always lead to happy outcomes. So who owes whom is going to be a very vexed argument. I mean, it's not settled. And then you also have the question of people who say, I've got a trillion dollars of oil in the ground or gas and you have to pay me money not to pump it out. Because otherwise, I'm going to be poor again. And I can understand their arguments. But if you took that to the logical conclusion, I think we're going to have a complete gridlock. So that's going to be very difficult. If you ask me where we shouldn't go, I think we shouldn't go there, but I'm afraid you can't avoid dealing with those issues. Thank you, PM, for that. Um, now we'll take questions from the floor. Um, there are two microphones on the two sides of the room. So do come up uh, and ask your question. And before you do, please uh, identify yourself and the organization that you represent for the benefit of everyone uh, in the audience. Uh, we'll take the questions uh, as a group. So let's have two or three questions. Uh, on the same topic, and then uh, PM can answer them uh, together. And can we have the first two or three questions uh, on uh, geopolitics uh, following uh, PM's uh, opening address? Yes, please. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Danny Kwa. I'm Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Thank you, Prime Minister, for spending this time with us. I wanted to pick up on two things that you mentioned on geopolitics. First is how the US-China relation is the most consequential one in the world. The second is how third countries want to keep things open and Asian countries should feel they have agency, strengthening multilateralism, making the right choices. Paradoxically, we're in a situation where the lesser powers need to help the great powers resolve their differences. What do you think is the most effective thing that third countries and Asian countries need to do at this point to pour oil on the water, on the disrupted water of US-China relations? Thank you very much. Can we have the second question, please? Yeah, Mr. Premier, thanks for your great presentation and speech. I think it's very illuminating. I'm a Zhu Fong, a professor from Nanjing University. My question is this. 
Yes, given some sort of uh, uh, suicidal trap. So China-U.S. relations is harder to just uh, distangle in the uh, coming years. But as you mentioned, so uh, keep the bilateral relations uh, manageable and peaceful and uh, controllable, not just to serve the two people's interests, but also for the uh, entire region and the uh, world. My question is, uh, next, uh, uh, I think the next month is quite likely then there will be an uh, APEC summit meeting and Chinese top leader also will uh, probably meeting the American counterpart. It's a second uh, Xi Biden, you know, just a, a we say, non-virtual meeting. So my question is, um, based on your great wisdom, if you were talk to the President Biden, what's the Chinese leaders supposed to speak up? Thank you. So, sorry, you want me to advise President Biden or President Xi? <laughs> I prefer to you advise the Chinese president. Thank you. Uh, PM, would you like to take these two questions? Okay. What can third countries do to help? I think what, we, what I said, suggested we should do in Asia will be helpful. And that is, third countries may be lined up close to America or closer to China but you want to do business with China, and you do want to maintain stable and constructive relations with China. And we can do that, which doesn't only depend on the third country, but also depends on China's part. Then, I think you have a, you have a less tense situation. China doesn't feel the whole world is ganging up against them, which I don't think is true, but I think there's a perspective in China. And America knows that it's got issues to deal with between it and China, and it's got friends who will uh, join it when you have to deal with particular problems, trade issues or whatever. But that this is a bilateral problem, and you're not having a global coalition line up against somebody whom you consider to be on the wrong side. I think that's one very important part of it. I think the other significant thing which depends on attitudes of the countries in the world uh, is Taiwan. Because one China is the basis on which nearly every country in the world uh, recognizes the PRC and has informal, unofficial relations with Taiwan. And I think that has to remain the fundamental basis on which the relationships are maintained and the status quo is justified. If we start thinking of Taiwan like as an analogy, as, as an analog of Ukraine, a member of the United Nations, which is Ukraine, an independent, sovereign country, and one which therefore deserves to be defended because it's on the good side and the others are on the wrong side, China is on the wrong side, I think you are changing a very fundamental basis of the, of the international understanding and it will have very dangerous consequences. And if countries can make that very clear, I think that is helpful. Uh, sometimes it's not so clear, and especially with a new generation and with uh, the media, uh, it becomes not a question of one China, but a question of um, democracy versus autocracy. And I think going that way is dangerous. Thirdly, I think what third countries can do is when there are issues between it and China, or it and the U.S., to stand up and to address them, talk about them, work on them, whether it's the South China Sea, whether it's the Senkakus, whether it's copyright, intellectual property issues, whether it's cybersecurity. These are things which are real problems. They have to be acknowledged. They have to be discussed. And 
It has to be worked out on, on as as the principles of five of coexistence say, equality and mutual respect, and in deed as well as in word. And I say this, I, I, I mean the items I list are mostly to do with relations with China because China is a factor which is changing in the world. It's a country which is growing, is a country which is occupying more space, stretching out, growing its influence, and accommodating that influence is the most important thing which China, which the world must do. And that calls for cooperation between China and the rest of the world. Now, on the APEC meeting between Xi and Biden, I think they are old friends, or they, they know each other for a very long time. They've spent a lot of time together, uh, many days, traveling in America, traveling in China. And I think they know what the problem is with one another. I don't think I'm in a position to advise President Xi what to say. He knows what the challenges are. The difficulty is to reach an understanding with the American president which acknowledges their differences but takes the edge off and de and takes the temperature down. At least avoid missteps and miscalculations and misunderstandings so that we can let the temperatures cool, maybe let some time pass, get past the election seasons, then we can pick up the relation and go forward again. We all know what election seasons are like. You have to say all sorts of things to get elected in a hot contest. You try to say things you won't regret later. But, well, sometimes these things happen, and you have to try and minimize the consequences of that. On the other, at the same time, you've got to show goodwill and understanding of how things appear to the other side to countries which find that the world has changed, that does, what used to be a small economy is now not so small and may be even bigger than you, and therefore is not going to be so easy to accommodate into the global system, and therefore has to make its own uh, concessions, its own accommodations, so that it is possible for very difficult transition to take place peacefully. And that's something which I think intellectually uh, Chinese leaders understand. In practice, making it happen and making, making it be appreciated and understood, that's a big challenge. Um, maybe we can have the next two or three questions on an issue that I think uh, has been uh, talked about quite a lot during these two days, and that is uh, climate change. And if we can have uh, questions from the floor uh, on, on that topic, and PM then can take it uh, together. No? Maybe I can one, ask one question then. Right, and this is how, you know, when we talk about climate change, how can a small country like Singapore, right, play its part uh, when actually it cannot make that much of an impact by itself? Well, we are an insignificant part of um, global emissions, like 0.5% mm -hmm. yes. or less. So even if we all stop breathing, it won't save the world. <laughs> That's a reality. And yet, we all have to do our part, mm. and we all have to chip in, both to reduce emissions and also to uh, work out solutions. And solutions include agreements, include rules, include um, negotiations at the UNFCCC. Mm. And we are... Um, 
participating actively in that. One of the areas where we are, which we are co-chairing and working on is um, developing carbon markets and what are the rules which should, which should apply to carbon markets. And you may have noticed that uh, Minister Grace Fu, uh, speaking just yesterday, uh, was announced how we are making rules for what are for ourselves, for what will be respectable carbon markets which you can trust and which will be meaningful and not just greenwashing. So we are participating in that way in the international effort. I think it's the least we can do. Uh, we can make a contribution, but of course it depends on many countries coming along. And um, unfortunately, the reality is the biggest countries, or perhaps I shouldn't say the biggest countries, the biggest emitters are very big, and they have to make very big adjustments. Mm. And I hope that they will, because um, unless they do, the problem cannot be solved. Any other questions from the floor? Yes. Uh, Wang Yangyu from City University of Hong Kong. Apologize to the moderator that I don't have a question on climate change. I have a question on uh, CPTPP. So the Prime Minister <coughs> alluded to the importance of RCEP. Uh, <coughs> China is a member of RCEP, but not yet one of the CPTPP. But to many people's surprise, China has applied to join the CPTPP. But given the geopolitical uh, rivalry contestation you alluded to, and also China's domestic economic structure, uh, how likely do you see a possible and successful Chinese membership uh, in the CPTPP in the near future? Thanks. I think that it's not so surprising that the Chinese applied to join the CPTPP. Uh, when first the TPP was conceived, the Chinese were very suspicious. They thought this was meant to set very high standards and therefore shape the ground rules against them and um, maybe there was some element of that in some of the members of the TPP. But as they studied it and they understood better what it involved, I think they came to the conclusion that there may be advantage for them to be in the CPTPP and to influence the process. And I think that they must have had some contacts with uh, CPTPP members and been in the TPP members, including the United States at that time, and being encouraged that this was, the door was not completely shut on them. And um, when America at the last moment said, no, I'm not going to join, and uh, Mr. Trump um, left it practically on the first day when he became president, uh, the Chinese had put, my, put their hands up and said, may I join? And in principle, we cannot say no, because if you meet the standards, if you are... Uh, if you are able to comply with all the requirements of the CPTPP, then it is something which we have to consider very, very seriously. But the decision is made by consensus. You have to settle with each of the countries, and in the end there has to be a consensus of all of the countries that this is something which they want to see happen, and then it can happen. So I think it will take some time. There are issues with Australia is in the process of being resolved. There will be issues with other countries which may take longer. But I think in the end, the consensus will not just depend on the economic arguments. It will depend also on ge geopolitical and strate strategic considerations. That's a reality. The pity of it is that this, ent this concept, the TPP, which was meant to bring the two sides of the Pacific together, in the end succeeded, not in full measure, but maybe in three-quarters measure, because we were able to carry it through, but we are there missing one very important original party, the United States. And I think it will be some time before the constellations shift, and it is possible to talk about the U.S. joining such a free trade organization. That's the reality, and uh, that's, that's where we are now. Thank you, PM. More questions from the floor, please? Yes. Uh, the gentleman over there. Uh, 
Um, Prime Minister, sir, my name is Harry and I'm from, uh, I run an SME and uh, now my own charity, Bridge Life. Um, I'd like to bring the question a bit nearer home, if I may. Uh, in 2016, uh, nine of our vehicles, uh, the Terex, uh, were held up in Hong Kong. And then at the point of time, uh, China said that uh, you, know, you either have diplomatic relations with either one of us, Taiwan or China. Uh, in today's scenario, it could happen again uh, with a more aggressive China in the South China Sea or even um, uh, with Taiwan again. So uh, two questions here. Uh, one is that uh, how do we handle this uh, in today's context uh, given a more uh, aggressive China? And secondly is that uh, are our 4G leaders ready to handle this uh, from a diplomatic perspective? Thank you. Well, first of all, the Terex incident didn't involve China. Uh, we had a shipment of vehicles. It passed through Hong Kong. The Hong Kong Customs Authorities impounded the vehicles. They said requirements had not, declarations had not been properly done. So we dealt with the Hong Kong authorities. And eventually, the Hong Kong authorities released the vehicles and we took them home. But we were dealing with, it, with Hong Kong on the merits of the case. So there was what you described uh, never happened. Secondly, I don't know what will happen if it occurs today. I'm sure we will do, deal with it with as much uh, attention and sensitivity as we did and propriety as we did in 2016. But I very much hope it doesn't happen. Thirdly, every leader of Singapore, and anybody, every minister in Singapore, as ministers as a team, needs to be able to hold Singapore's place in the world and friendly relationships, as well as dealing with problems which arise from time to time. And these are things which we have been working with, working on in cabinet. The ministers are involved in the decisions; they participate in them, and I'm confident that. When they take over, they will be ready, they will be well supported, and they will grow in experience and stature with time in the job. I think there was one question just now. Uh, thank you, Wei Kong. Um, I'm Asad Latif from The Straits Times. Uh, Prime Minister, what I'm going to ask is, Kind of you, you set the tone for that in, in your last uh, a few sentences. There was a speaker this morning who described Singapore as the best governed country on earth. My question is this. Would you, since this, is, this conference is about the centenary of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, would you like to throw your mind back a bit and describe how Mr. Lee managed to set in motion this best governed country on earth when the international situation was so dire, and therefore today, as the 4G prepares to take over, how do you think this very disturbing international situation will mold it? Do you think this is where Mr. Lee's thoughts should um, almost perhaps become biblical in, in dealing with um, very nasty secular times? Thank you. Well, as Mr. Lee used to say, I... It was good that things turned out this way. I'm not sure I would like to do it again because I may not be lucky the second time. And there's a lot of um, contingency in what happened. We tried, we worked very hard. We made sure we maximized our chances. But we had lucky breaks along the way. And fortunately, we were able to make the most of them. Uh, we, didn't, we tried very hard to avoid being an independent country. We did not believe it was viable. We went into Malaysia. That turned out to be non-viable, and we were thrown out. We had to make a living for ourselves. It was an indelible experience, which I think girded that generation of Singaporeans to take life very seriously and to determine to make a success of it. Fortunately for Singapore, at that time, the uh, left-wing opposition party, which had 
13, 14 seats in Parliament, decided to declare this a sham independence, that it wasn't a real country, and to boycott Parliament and abandon the field to the PAP. The PAP expanded, took over, won all the seats in Parliament, and for about 15, 16 years, we were in absolute control and were able to focus on development, on growth, on nation building, on building leadership, on taking the country forward, undistracted by politics. And that was a, and we were able to continue that trend even into the 1980s, 1920s, 2020, 2020, 2020s now, with a very high degree of national consensus on what the country needs to do. And we have been fortunate, we have built up a high quality civil service and maintain high standards in the public service, in the politics, and we've kept our system clean. And therefore, got into a virtuous cycle where you show results, people trust you, the trust is critical, you can produce more results. You still have to win elections, and therefore you have to keep your feet on the ground and make sure that you perform, and you can't start to lord it on over people. You are there to serve. But we've got that virtuous cycle, and we are in a Garden of Eden state. It's one of those things which depends on the path we got here, and that's why we are here. And if you leave this, you are not going to come back in again. And our job is to try very hard to make people understand that and to work together to keep it going for as long as we can. So it's not a magic formula. It's not something you can just pick up and put in a different country. We were lucky. Uh, we now have this tremendous asset and we are in a difficult environment now and we have to make the most of it to make Singapore succeed in a very changed world. And policies have to change and keep up to date with the times. When we were growing rapidly, we could afford to say, we, we focus on education, health care, housing. The rest of it, all the, um, all the comforts of, the, of welfare and social support, uh, we can't afford that. And we need people to be focused on working, doing their best for themselves. It worked. Because the jobs were there, if you are prepared to work, you can do it. Now, the jobs are still there. If you are prepared to work, you need to have the right skills to do it. And yesterday's skills may not be the same as tomorrow's skills. And how do I help you go from yesterday to tomorrow? And how do I make you make that transition and not end up a loser in a country where other people are winning and you have a divided and very unhappy society. It means we have to intervene to, with social support, we have to intervene with training, education for adults. We have to help things happen, which in the past we could say the economy will take care of it, we just focus on providing the preconditions. The world changed, the policies have to change. Yesterday, somebody asked Tio Chi Hen, what would Mr. Lee say or do if he were here today? And he recounted how uh, so he asked a visitor, and the visitor said, what, what would Teng Xiaoping do? And the answer was, Teng Xiaoping would do exactly what we are doing today. Hmm. Well, we are not so lucky. When we look at the problems in a new situation, we ask ourselves, what would Mr. Lee do today? Doesn't mean what he did previously and how do I do that now? But in this new world, if he had this experience and were confronted with this situation, with the same ideals, the same objectives, the same drive to make Singapore succeed, what is the best thing to do? 
And unfortunately, Mr. Lee cannot provide that answer. We have to think of that answer. And we have to make it work. I think we have time for one last question. So, yes, please. Hello, I'm oh, Grace. Okay. Yeah, please continue. Hello, I'm Grace Lin from Lingan Poly. Um, my question is related to social sustainability. So, even though we are trying to refresh the social compact, many students, especially those in ASEAN countries, still opt for careers that are more stable or quote unquote mainstream rather than what they are truly passionate about. And as a result, many of them start experiencing burnout sometime during their career as they realize that they are doing something that they're not very passionate about. Hence, we are seeing many youths taking gap years and switching between careers and just feeling very conflicted between societal expectation and what they truly want. So I want to ask what are your views and our advice to youths on this issue. Thank you. I think you would... We would like young people to do things which they want to do, but I would like young people to know that whatever you do, there will be a lot of hard work. <laughs> and there will be a lot of times when you will find it's not exciting, not thrilling, not top of the world, but you have to persevere and press on, and then eventually at the end of it, you look back and say, well, overall, I chose the right course. To become a concert pianist, you must play a lot of scales. It's very boring. And you have to be drilled and practiced. And you can't help that. Maybe one day you can just infuse the AI into your brain and your fingers will know what to do. But life is like that. Uh, it's good to strike out on a different path. It's good if you have a passion doing social work or you want to work with a particular disadvantaged group or you have talent for the arts, you work at it, you, you go that direction. But we also have to be practical about it and apply ourselves and as you grow up, gradually you get a better sense of knowing what you want to do. A gap year is not a bad thing. To my generation, it's a luxury. Nobody in my generation ever talked about a gap year. We didn't know what it was. But nowadays, I read about people doing it, and it's, it's quite normal. Well, it's good that you have this opportunity. Take it, see the world, learn a bit more, and uh, round yourself up. Grow up in new directions, and therefore be more prepared to play a role, to contribute, and to make a difference over what I hope will be a long and productive lifetime. But we have time. Maybe you can take another one or two yes. questions. All right. Mm -hmm. I think Mr. Ma wants to ask a question. Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Fu Fang Jian, and I'm a professor from SMU, uh, local university here. Uh, yeah, so just now, uh, Prime Minister offered excellent advices for both Chinese and American leaders. Right, but uh, you also mentioned that Taiwan factor is an important factor lie in between the relation of these two great nations. So, uh, and uh, you know, according to the polls, the majority of the Taiwanese people seems to want to maintain the status quo. Uh, on the other hand, you know, we know there is an election uh, soon to be in, in next year. Right, so, uh, you know, uh, now, I have two related questions. One is, uh, how do you think the status quo, the so-called status quo, is uh, sustainable in the long run? Number two, uh, what kind of ad excellent advices you would offer to the leaders, the next leaders of the Taiwanese people? Thank you. I, I explained just now what the status quo depends on. It depends on concept of one China. Uh, in Taiwan, in more recent times, the idea is the 1992 consensus. What exactly it is, is open to discussion, but it is called the 1992 consensus, and it worked. And it's no longer the basis on which uh, cross-strait relations are being conducted, and how to find a way forward from that is a challenge. 
I think my advice is not to the Taiwanese leaders, but my, I would say all parties dealing with this cross strait situation would have to be very, very careful not to edge closer and closer to a dangerous situation which can lead to a misunderstanding or a mishap. You may remember in 2001, soon after George W. Bush became president, there was an EP3 accident incident. An EP-3 was flying off the coast of southern China. It collided with a PRC fighter jet. The PRC fighter crashed. The pilot presumed drowned. The EP-3 was crippled, landed in Hainan Island. US EP-3. It took several weeks of very difficult discussions and delicate diplomacy to get over that, to have a form of words for the US to say, regret what happened and to get their aeroplane and their servicemen back. Could such an incident happen today? Yes. Can it be resolved as readily? Not at all clear. It may spiral off in any number of directions. So the dangers are there. Each little step you take, and I would say, each time somebody makes a little move, the other side makes another little move. And there are three parties in this, the US, the China, and Taiwan. And each is reacting to the other and is a dynamic which no single party is fully controlling. And you have to try your best not to let it go out of control. You may think you are safe. You take a half step wrong and you may find yourself on a cliff. I but I think can. Mr. Mind, you knows much more about this than me. Yes. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Because uh, just a while ago, you talked about mainland China, Taiwan, cross trade relations. I think this is a good opportunity uh, for me to let you know. I think it's very important to make the two sides of Taiwan trade to meet, to dialogue, and to try to find out the solution. Actually, Singapore twice played the meeting place of uh, the two sides. One in, uh, I think, 19, 1993, and another one in... 1992, uh, 1992, 1993, Wang Dao Han yeah. in, in Singapore. And 2015, Xi Jinping and myself also in mm. Singapore. Now, it's a very crucial time to the two sides. If Taiwan and mainland China could work out something, I think the, colli the collision between China and US may be avoided. That is why I'm here calling uh, the countries involved to uh, uh, encourage Taiwan and mainland China to have a dialogue on how to resolve the situation. And uh, I think, I hope, for those of you who are concerned about the situation, not just uh, Asia, but also the world, to encourage Taiwan and mainland China to meet, to have a dialogue, and to try to find out the solution. I think this is a very good uh, opportunity to do this job. So for those of you who attend this conference, please join me, join me <laughs> to call for this dialogue, all right? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I think dialogue is essential. I believe that the two sides are talking. But from dialogue, you must move, if not to meeting of minds, at least to a mutual understanding of each other's positions and some understanding of how to take positive, positive steps forward. We were very happy on two occasions to play host in Singapore. Uh, if the circumstances um, just dictate a further meeting, further meetings in future, we'll be very happy to be the party sitting there, providing the room and pouring the tea. <laughs> okay, I think we can take two more questions, uh, Jillian, and then maybe uh, Ambassador Ishii, you can ask your question, and then PM can answer it uh, together. Uh, Jillian, please. Uh, 
Thank you, moderator. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. We feel so privileged to be in this room to listen to you uh, discuss geopolitics and uh, how third countries, and certainly Singapore, should posture itself, what policies it should take. My question is this. What is the extent to which you think Singaporeans grasp what you are sharing, that they understand this? Is it to a satisfactory level, or do you feel that that understanding uh, uh, needs to be better propagated? If so, I would like to ask you, Prime Minister, a second question, which is the extent to which you think you and the government are able to influence those un that understanding or sentiment versus the extent to which the, they are receiving influence from other sources and whether those sources are helpful, be they explicit, upfront, or covert. What are your um, anxieties about Singaporeans' grasp of international relations? Thank you, Prime Minister. Oops. Thank you, Prime Minister. My name is Masafumi Ishii. I am a retired Japanese diplomat, uh, last post being uh, Ambassador of Japan to Indonesia. Uh, I have two quick questions. First question is, uh, can you talk a little bit more about India? What kind of role you expect uh, you want to see India play in the region? Second question, can you share with us your vision for the, of the future of ASEAN and what should be done to reach to that vision? Thank you. Me to answer? Okay. Uh, first, on Jillian's question, I think Singaporeans uh, are exposed to the international news more than citizens of nearly any other country. We are living in a very open society. People, we travel overseas a lot. So you see the world. But I don't know that it is top of the mind because we have many other things to think about day to day, looking, bringing up our families, making sure that you can deal with the cost of living, all the, the personal and professional concerns which everybody except diplomats have. Yeah. So we do need to have a general understanding amongst the population that the country is taking the right foreign policy stance. And as I said in my opening remarks, it is important that you have domestic support for the stance you take internationally because otherwise it becomes not sustainable. And I think in Singapore, there is domestic support for the positions we take. For example, on Ukraine, where we took a very strong stand and we did straw polls and it showed that Singaporeans understand that you have to stand up because sovereignty is at stake, because fundamental principles of the UN Charter are at stake. And if we don't speak up on this, Clearly, regardless of who it is against whom, because of the principles, one day it happens to us, nobody will speak up for us. So I think in their own ways, Singaporeans do understand what's what. Of course, they're also exposed to many other sources of information and disinformation. Some come on WhatsApp, some come on Telegram, some come in different languages. And they have some influence, and we have to go out and counter them, and we have been working very hard to make sure that we put out correct messages and to make sure people understand when you read something, you know, you have a sense, where is it coming from? What is he trying to want to make you think? And that is a ceaseless task. We keep on working at it. We have a phrase called POFMA, it has become a verb, I can pofma you. Those who are from overseas, you'll find out what it is. It's not a laughing matter, it's a serious requirement to make sure that when untruths are published online, there's a way for the untruth to be flagged, and people know that this, these are not facts, these are assertions which are strongly disputed, and in the government's view, false. So we will keep on trying to work at that. But it's not possible for us to have a great firewall 
and to keep out information or misinformation from the rest of the world. We are open to it. We are English speaking and also bilingual. And therefore, we have to deal with this. As Teng Xiaoping says, when you open the windows, the fresh air comes in, but so do the flies and the mosquitoes. Now, uh, the question of India's role, I think India has, aspires to play a major role in the region. Uh, they chaired G20 extremely actively. They mobilized what, they call, what is now called the Global South and articulated concerns, which are concerns for the developing countries in Africa, in Latin America, in the South Pacific, Caribbean. Uh, it's growing rapidly. Its population is young. It has the potential to be a major active player in the world. And one which will make its own calculations. It is not just going to be a participant in the Quad and therefore um, go along with the consensus of other countries. It has its own calculations, its own strategic interests, and it will make its own calculations. And they are skillful at doing this. But their GDP is small. They are one-fifth of China's GDP. Their international trade is not huge. It's one-fifth of China's international trade. So their external reach is not quite the same, but if they sustain growth, which we hope they will, I think their, inf their, their heft will grow, and we hope that it will be deployed to a constructive purpose for the region. We have always felt that India has a major contribution to make to Asia, so people talk about the Indo-Pacific now, but you may not know, but we have in ASEAN what we call the East Asia Summit. And despite the name, India is part of the East Asia Summit. It's not in East Asia, it's only in the summit. But it's in the summit for a strategic reason, because we felt that India within this region has a role to play, and one day it will grow into that role. Uh, the vision for ASEAN ASEAN has a formal vision. If you look up the ASEAN website, you will find the ASEAN vision for 2040, um, which sets out all the things we want to do. But essentially, we would like a group of countries which are able to overcome the bilateral difficulties to make common cause, cooperate economically, integrate regionally, and make their voice heard at international fora, whether it's a trade negotiation, whether it's at the UN, whether they are talking about climate change, to have a view which can be, which people will pay attention to, which individually we would not be able to do. We will not be able to do that on all issues. On some strategic issues, there will be very different perspectives. Certainly on the South China Sea, between countries which have claims, like the Philippines, or Vietnam, and countries which don't even have a literal a shoreline on the South China Sea, like Myanmar, there will be very different views. And so it will be harder to make a consensus, but to the extent possible, uh, we will try very hard to make ASEAN work. And I think all the ASEAN members want to make it work and want and find it valuable. And I think that's the test of whether it has been a success. Thank you, PM. Uh, I think we all wish we can spend the whole evening here with PM, but unfortunately the time has come uh, to end this dialogue. Uh, can we please uh, join our hands and thank uh, Prime Minister for spending his time with us. <laughs>